Mr. President, when the Baltic Sea strategy was conceived, when the idea was first promoted, how did this come to be? Well, the first thing that happened was that uh, I was, when I was elected to the European Parliament, uh, I looked at the map and I realized that with, uh, with the accession of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, that uh, the Baltic Sea had become, for all intents and purposes, an EU inner sea or EU lake. I mean, okay, you had a little outcropping there in Kaliningrad, the former Königsberg, and then you had sort of at the end of the Gulf of Finland down there, you had, you had St. Petersburg. And, and uh, given the issues and problems that we had been facing for a while already uh, with uh, pollution, it's a brackish sea, it seemed that it would make sense now with uh, almost all of the sea surrounded by the EU that we should develop a policy. And so it began actually in something called an intergroup, which we, you have kind of voluntary associations within the uh, European Parliament, and I, I wrote a report. And then we presented that to, uh, uh, to President Barroso, and he thought it was a good idea, and then uh, this moved on and then we're to the Parliament as a regular uh, report. Uh, and here, Alex Stubb took over, my colleague, who I understand is here in the audience somewhere. So that was the, initi uh, the initial idea, was to actually treat issues at an EU level that are specific to the region, and most specific, of course, is the Baltic Sea. There is another uh, feature that is a bit untraditional with this strategy, uh, or how do you see that? With the established EU policies, um, they, they normally have a, an end objective. Is this macro-regional strategy different in that sense? Given that there are so many commonalities in this region, not only based on having a common littoral around the Baltic, but, but in fact, uh, if you look at certain areas, uh, not only uh, ecological, but say, I mean, where, what are the most developed uh, uh, regions in terms of digitization in the European Union. And so uh, why not develop those? Uh, and, uh, you know, when you have, uh, when you have a, a Europe of very large states and very small states, then clearly regions that have commonalities need to stick together to have, you know, to have a weight. Uh, it seemed like it would make sense that if there are things that we all have in common, that maybe we should uh, work together and among ourselves to actually promote certain views. Certainly in the case of digitization, as we've seen just as recently as our presidency, Estonia's presidency in the second half of 97, I mean, digitization was something not only that we promoted, but our strongest supporters, in fact, were countries around the Baltic Sea. There are very substantive issues uh, to be discussed, uh, environment, uh, digitization, uh, connectivity. Is this macro-regional macro strategy in our, in our region, is that a, a, a positive sort of, of, of multi-speed Europe? I mean, when you talk about multi-speed Europe, you talk about the ones sort of the core countries, you talk about the peripheral countries, but not in terms of uh, geography, actually, but in terms of attitudes towards European integration. And I would say, you know, overwhelmingly, the countries around the Baltic Sea are, uh, are interested in, in deepening uh, integration. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for these uh, encouraging words. Well, thank you, and I wish all of the participants uh, uh, fruitful discussions. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all to the ninth annual forum of the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region. Thank you, President Ilves and Mr. Marzikas, for, for reminding us the very essentials that uh, bring us all together here, both the challenges and opportunities we face as a region. My name is Johannes Stralla, and I'm usually based in Brussels, working as the correspondent for Estonian public broadcasting. And this here, ladies and gentlemen, if I can introduce you to, is the Baltic Sea, freshly captivated in a jar early hours this morning. Now, besides the fact that it 
is captivated in a rather small jar, I think it's fair to say that it's doing, or she's doing, better than nine years ago when uh, this uh, forum and this strategy started. The levels of nitrogen are, are lower than nine years ago, and although we still face challenges with uh, low oxygen levels and, and marine litter, marine litter uh, I still think uh, a big progress has been made with the strategy, and I would like to keep the Baltic Sea here on this stage, Hopefully she can absorb some of the good vibes and good will that is floating around uh, this space. Now, there's also a Wi-Fi floating around uh, this space. It's free. You can sign in uh, using uh, the password after 2020. And uh, should there be an unlikely event that uh, poses a need to evacuate the building, an alarm will sound, and you can use the four exits, one over there, two over there, and one in that corner, to evacuate the building. Now, there's also perhaps one thing worthy of your attention, and that is taking place in the very inner courtyard of uh, this venue. As we start the forum, Estonian Academy of Arts uh, students from the academy are assembling a rather interesting composition out of marine litter that was gathered rather recently. So during one of the coffee breaks, I uh, certainly suggest you check out their composition. Hopefully it's inspiring, hopefully it shows that at least artists still have work and we also still have work to do to clean uh, the sea. But now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to give the floor over to our most distinguished speakers to open the forum. Interpretation, as you have probably noticed, is available. Use the headphones supplied. And may I first ask the Prime Minister of Estonia, Mr. Yuri Ratas, to take the stage. Prime Ministers from Latvia and Lithuania, Foreign Minister from Poland, Vice President Einzip and Commissioner Kretsu, dear friends of the Baltic Sea Corporation, ladies and gentlemen, I am really honoured to open the European Union Baltic Sea Strategy 9th Annual Forum here in Tallinn. I am particularly glad that this forum is back in Tallinn, where it started in 2010. I would like to thank all the stakeholders of the strategy for their commitment over nine years. I would also use the opportunity to thank all the partners of the forum, Baltic Development Forum, European Commission, European Regional Development Fund, and many others. Thanks to our constant work and daily input and the enthusiasm of the organizers of this event, I can greet here today such a large audience. Dear audience, the Baltic Sea strategy is the EU at its best. It is about concrete projects and actions close to the people and it is about implementing EU policies. For Estonia and other small EU member states, most of the challenges have strong cross-border element. For example, issues concerning environment protection of the Baltic Sea or transport networks, around it we can solve only together. Or seven countries of the strategy besides Estonian represent more than half of our goods and services export. Regional cooperation is and remains a priority for Estonia. There are multiple regional cooperation formats in Baltic Sea region. Better coordination, 
division of labor and avoiding publication are the aspects we have to work on. Regional cooperation must be focused on real results and real benefits. We have to explain it better to our people in order to involve as many active participants as possible. The main aim of the forum today is to discuss the future of our region and of the strategy after 2020. I would like to address in my remarks the following aspects, the digital cooperation, environment and new EU financial framework. Dear ladies and gentlemen, in a modern world, there is a lot we can do together to make this region move more dynamically, more become economically more competitive. Forum the changes within the last decades, we can see that the digital transition in radical changes almost every part of our lives. When looking to the future, we can see that the speed of changes is increasing. In order to collect the dividends of the Industrial Revolution and make the everyday lives of our citizens better, we need to move together. We need to speed and up and improve cooperation. We as a region have a unique opportunity globally to become the model of for digital governance. The digital change is transforming the mobility with self-driving cars. The artificial intelligence is finding almost all interactions in our everyday life. There are just some examples why we need to embrace these radical changes together in order to boost our cooperation of the digital agenda. We need to create a place where not only the Baltic Sea concepts people, connects people, but also data streams flow between governments, authorities in a seamless, seamless way. It is only when the data can move around in a trusted, transparent, and we need it private way. We truly embrace the new society. The data flows need to open up for various different cross-border services. Take, for inst instance, medical prescriptions. Every citizen should have the possibility to go to a pharmacy in its neighboring country and received a medicine by own doctor in a person's home country. Finland and Estonia have already united a governmental data exchange system, and we are testing our several business models. For exchanging tax data to medical data, the possibilities are endless. I invite all countries to join in this data exchange project coordinated by the Nordic Interoperability Solutions and let's build a new standard for a governance. Dear guests, our common Baltic Sea is one of the world's largest brackish water bodies with an extremely fragile ecosystem. We have to step up our efforts regarding environment, as can be seen from the recent status of the Baltic Sea assessment. Our sea is not in, the, in a good shape. The situation of the sea is not good because of us. Therefore, continued efforts to reduce the environmental impacts by agriculture, industries, maritime transport, or fishing and also aquaculture are still needed. As a positive step forward, just a few months ago, in March, the ministers of the environment and high-level representatives of the nine Baltic coastal countries and the European Union endorsed a ministerial declaration to improve the status of the Baltic Sea. 
With the declaration, all Baltic Sea countries commit to implement the Baltic Sea Action Plan in order to move towards the 2021 goal to restore the ecological balance of the sea. We have to intensify our efforts, especially as regards the efficient use and management of nutrients, building up a system to fight against the marine litter and finding measures to reduce the dangerous substances. Honorable participants, the next EU multi-annual financial framework reflects changes, circumstances, and new priorities. It foresees increase in funding for digitalization, research, and innovation, youth and education, internal and external security, migration and defense. These areas are vital for more competitive, integrated, and secure Europe. I'm really happy to see that transport and energy also remain prominent priorities because these are very important for our region. I hope that Rail Baltic, connecting the Baltic states with the rest of Europe, will be ready and operational by 2026. I would like to see our energy systems to be synchronized with Europe as soon as possible. These are important projects, not only in terms of connectivity or economy, but also in terms of regional security. Due to Brexit, the decrease of the budget was expected. However, it seems that the cuts proposed in two major policies of the EU, namely cohesion policy and common agricultural policy, are too large. Although many regions have been developing rapidly, also in our region, they are still far from EU average level of economic development. The size of cuts proposed could harm the overall competitiveness of the EU. Regarding common agricultural policy, the direct payments per hectare still differ a lot between member states while the aim is to ensure equal market conditions for farmers. Cohesion funds remain a key source for investments to address development needs and achieve long-term national and EU objectives. As need differ in regions, the scope of cohesion policy should remain wide. There should also more flexibility for regions to decide in which area EU funding would address best the main bottleneck for development. It is also important that maritime cross-border programs would continue. As a member state that has endlessly faced the need for simplification in implementing cohesion policy, we are glad to see many proposals that make the use of funds simpler for all sides. To conclude, there are many good examples of the positive developments in our region and in areas covered by strategy. There are around 100 flagship projects, and Estonia is active participant in many of them. Pollution of our sea has showed down and it means progress towards cleaner beaches and healthy fish. Our resource services are better prepared for joint action during natural disasters and accidents. The use of energy is much, much more efficient and the role of renewable energy increases. The results are based on agreed joint policies and joint national actions. We need more of it. Strategy should have more focus on real important issues where joint efforts would bring clear added value. Still, the changes remain. We have to work towards 
how to better integrate the strategy into other EU policies, giving it macro-regional dimension, and how to aim the strategy into EU funding, especially looking into the new EU multi-annual financial framework. I wish you interesting, fruitful, and of course useful discussions, which will hopefully lead the new ideas, new contacts, new projects, and result in a better life in our region. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Prime Minister Ratas. I'm glad to invite the Prime Minister of Latvia, Mr. Maris Kuczynskis, on the stage. Good afternoon, Premier Minister Ratas Kungs. Godātājs Lietuvas premjerministra Skvernēkungs, godātājs Eiropas komisijas viceprezidenta Ansipkungs, cienījāmā komisāra Kretz Kundze, godājamie ministri, jūsu ekscelents, dāmas un kungi. Esmu patiesi pagodināts kopā ar Baltijas un Polijas kolēģiem, Eiropas komisijas viceprezidenta un komisāri atklāt vienu no gaidītākajiem fórumiem, kurā pulcējas Baltijas jūras draugi. Ar Eiropas Savienības stratēģiju Baltijas jūras reģionam esam bijuši ceļa aizsācēji. Eiropas Savienībā mūs atpazīst kā zaļu, vidēji draudzīgu un inovatīvu reģionu Eiropas ziemeļos. Kopš stratēģijas apstiprināšanas Ar mūsu kopējām pūlēm ir īstenot daudzi veiksmīgi projekti. Tomēr nav pamata apstāties, jo mums priekšā ir lieli izaicinājumi un iespējas. Šajos gados esam mērķiecīgi strādājuši pie transporta un enerģētikas savienojumības. Baltijas valstis daudz paveikuši ceļā no enerģētikas salas uz integrāciju Eiropas Savienības projekti. Tirgu pateicoties būtiskam Eiropas Savienības atbalstam. Reģionālā sadarbība ar nozīmīgu Eiropas komisijas līdzdalību ir sniegus nozīmīgu ieguldījumu funkcionējoša un atvērta elektrības un gāzes tirgus izveidē. Tādēļ Eiropas Savienības enerģētikas savienības mērķi un principi mums saglabājas īpaši svarīgi. Šodien ar Baltijas valstu un Polijas kolēģiem bijām viens prāts, ka kopīgi jāstrādā, lai bez kavēšanās īstenot drošu un ilgspējīgu Baltijas valstu elektrības tīklus sinkronizāciju ar kontinentālās Eiropas tīkliem. Latvija kā stratēģijas enerģētikas politikas koordinators liela uzmanība pievērsīs digitālo un viedot tehnoloģiju attīstībai enerģētikā. Savukārt transporta jomā Raila Baltika ir lielākais un nozīmīgākais dzelzceļa infrastruktūras projekts reģionā un viens no svarīgākajiem infrastruktūras projektiem visā Eiropas Savienībā. Dāmas un kungi, digitalizācija ir mūsu ikdiena un nākotne. Mākslīgais intelekts, pētniecība, inovācijas ir mūsu uzmanības centrā. Latvijā attīstam datos balstītas nācijas konceptu. Tajā balstoties uz publisko datu pieejamību, sabiedrības izglītošanu un iesaistīšanu caur atvērtajiem datiem, strādājam pie jauniem un inovatīviem produktiem. Šī iniciatīva ir attīstīta valdībai, augstskolām un uzņēmējiem, sadarbojoties ar tādiem biznesa parteriem, kā piemēram Microsoft, kas atvērs savu kādu reģionālo centru Rīgā. Ar cerībām skatāmies uz inovāciju ekosistēmas attīstību Eiropas Savienībā. Vēlētos, lai arī mūsu inovatori, to starp mākslīgā intelekta, kvantu datori, viedo automašīnu jomā, sevi šajā ietvarā ieraudzītu. Apzināmies, ka fokus būs 
uz dažiem lieliem projektiem. Vienlaiks inovācijas, kas maina tirgus darbību sākotnējā stadijā bieži rodas tieši mazākos projektos un uzņēmumos. Mēs bieži runājām par Eiropas pievienoto vērtību. Redzu, ka starptautiskā dimensija, ko var dot Eiropas Savienības līmeņa atbalsts, ir īpaši būtisks tieši mazajiem spēlētājiem. Vienlaiks mums būs jādara viss, lai piesaistītu globālos privātos investorus. Runājot par inovācijām plašākā kontekstā, uzskata, ka īpaši svarīga loma ir reģionālais sadarbībai un reģionālajiem ekscelents centriem. Te vēlos izcelt Ziemeļu valstu un Baltijas valstu sadarbību 5G ekosistēmas attīstībā, veicot kopīgas pērtījumus un pārbaudes. Baltijas jūras stratēģijas forums notiek laikā, kad esam uzsākuši diskusijas par nākamā Eiropas Savienības daudzgadu budžetu. Uzskatām, ka dzīves līmeņa izlīdzināšanai Eiropas Savienībā ir jābūt galvenai daudzgadu budžetu prioritātei. Mēs iestāstamies par adekvātu kohēzijas politikas finansējumu un strādāsim, lai kohēzijas līdzekļu sadaus kritēriju nodrošinātu uzsvaru uz reģioniem, kas vēl atpaliek no Eiropas Savienības vidējā IKP. Baltijas valstis ir apliecinājušas darbībā, ka ir kohēzijas politikas veiksmas tāsts. Vienlaiks mums ir būtiska integrēta Eiropas Savienības pērtniecības, inovācija, digitālās vides attīstība. Tāpēc, jo īpaši novērtējam Eiropas komisijas piedāvājumu, nākamā daudzgadu budžeta periodā palielināt finansējumu pētniecībai un inovācijām digitālās jomas attīstībai. Dzīves līmeņa izlīdzināšana Eiropas Savienībā vairs nav iedomājama bez digitālo risinājumu atbalstu. Nemazāk nozīmīgs ir finansējums Eiropas infrastruktūras savienošanai. Dāmas un kungi, novēlījumi šajā formā – vērtīgi viedokļu apmaiņu, lai sekmētu jaunu projektu izstrādi un to īstenošanu ap Baltijas jūru. Paldies! Thank you very much, Prime Minister Kuczynskis. I would now like to give the floor to Prime Minister of Lithuania, Mr. Saulius Kvernelis. Gerbimi kolegos, diskusijų dalyviai, svečiai. Pirmiausia, noriu padėkoti Estijos ministrui pirmininkui už kvietimą dalyvauti devintajame kasmetinėme Europos Sąjungos, Baltijos, Jūros regiono strategijos forume. Nuodadavomas į sprogą, norėčiau pasidalinti su jumis keletų minčių ir pasvarstimu apie regioną ir regionui svarbius klausimus. Kitam atminėsime Baltijos šalių ir Lenkijos narystės Europos Sąjungoje 15 metų jubilėjų. Taip pat 10 metų nuo to laiko, kai Briuselyje buvo patvirtinta tuo metu pirmoji Europos Sąjungos makroregioninė strategija Europos Sąjungos Baltijos jūros regiono strategija. Svarbi žinia, kad Europoje augant ir plečiantis dėmesys mūsų ir kitiems regionams ne tik nemažėja, bet priešingai didėja. Per šį laikotarpį mūsų pasiekimai stiprinant dvi šalius santykius ir regioniniai bendradarbėjama Tikrai įspūdingi. Esame didžiausi vieni kitų prekybos partneriai, daug investuojame, o mūsų piliečiai visą labiau atranda ne tik mūsų sostinės – Vilnių, Rygą ar Taliną, bet ir regionus, mažesnius miestus ir miestelius. Antra vertus – būtų per anksti sakyti, kad viskas jau padaryta. Pasaulis judai priekį kosminių greičių, todėl turime prisitaikyti ir mes – ir visas Baltijos regionas. Atskirai norėčiau pakalbėti apie energetiką. 2009 metais buvo patvirtinta Baltijos jūros regiono strategija 
ir pasirašytas Baltijos energetikos rinkų jungčių planas, kuris vis dar tebe turi strateginę reikšmę regionui. Per beveik dešimt metų daug pasiekėme įgyvendinami pagrindinį šio plano tikslą – integruoti Baltijos šalių energetikos rinkas į Europos Sąjungos energetikos rinką, kurti infrastruktūrą ir užtikrinti, kad rinka tinkamai veiktų, būtų tvari, saugi ir svarbiausia konkurencinga. Jau dabar turime veikiančias elektros jungti su Lenkija ir Švedija. Energetinį regiono saugumą stiprina Lenkijoje ir Lietuvoje pradėjęs veikti suskystintų dujų terminalai. Prie savaitę žengtas dar vienas svarbus žingsnis šią linkme. Jeigu žiais 24 dieną Lietuvos ir Lenkijos dujų perdavimo sistemos operatoriai pasirašė galutinę investicijų sutartį ir praeidėjo dujotekio tarp Lietuvos ir Lenkijos tiesimo etapą. Bendromis pastangomis judami į priekį, tačiau padaryta tikrai dar ne viskas. Vienas svarbiausių nepadarytų darbų yra Baltijos šalių elektros tinklų sinkronizavimas su kontinentinės Europos tinklais. Šis projektas visą pusiškai svarbus, nes leistų mums pagaliau atsijungti nuo senosios brel sistemos. Proveržiau tikiuosi jau ir timiausiomis savaitėmis ir apie tai kalbėjau su kolegomis šio vizito metu. Leiskite grįžti prie Baltijos jūros regiono strategijos. Labai svarbu į strategijos įgyvendinimą dar labiau įtraukti mūsų šalių piliečius ir bendruomenės. Kartu su savo kaimynėmis Lietuva yra strategijos transporto, energetikos, bioekonomikos, politinių sryčių koordinatoriai. Ir tai nėra atsitiktinumas. Tikime, kad aktyviau bendradarbiaudami suartinsime verslus, nevyriausybinį sektorių ir paprastus žmonės. Na, pabaigai apie ateitį. Šios dienos renginyje ekspertai, akademiniais visuomenės, valdžios institucijų atstovai diskutuos apie Baltijos jūros šalių bendradarbiavimą po 2020 jų. Mūsų regiono šaliais jau daugelį metų pasižymi atsakinga fiskalinė politika. Tai yra ir bus mūsų regiono reputacijos klausimas. Kaip mes matom savo ateitį, kokie nauji instrumentai galėtų suteikti tą proveržį, kurio mes visi norime? Nebejotina. Tai yra skaitminizavimas ir naujos technologijos. Jų pritaikymas visose ekonominio ir socialinio gyvenimo srityse. Matome milžinišką skaitminizacijos potencialą, skatinant ekonomikos konkurencingumą, verslo ir žmonių mobilumą. Kas žino, galbūt atėjo laikas mūsų regione rimta imtis kripto ekonomikos klausimų. Blockchain technologija siūlo naujų galimybių mūsų makro regionui, Europos Sąjungos valstybėms ir kartu visiems mūsų piliečiams. Dar kartą dėkoju iš kvietimą, linkiu sėkmės ir turiningų diskusijų. Thank you, Prime Minister. I am now honored to invite the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland, Mr. Jacek Czaputowicz, to address the forum. The floor is yours, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank our Estonian hosts for their excellent organization and hospitality. It is an honor for me to participate in the opening session of the ninth EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region forum in Tallinn. The Baltic Sea region after the year 2020 doesn't seem to be a very distant perspective. I would even say that the future of the Baltic Sea region after 2020 is here and now, and it is all about us, citizens of the macro region. Poland perceives the Baltic cooperation as one of the, its foreign policy priorities. The Baltic Sea region is simply our home. We want this home to be safe, prosperous, and interconnected, a good place for our citizens to live in. In order to make it happen, we need a, to join our efforts. 
and pay special attention to the state of our environment, especially the endangered marine ecosystem, develop sustainable infrastructural network, address pressing social trends, such as aging of population, also by applying the model of circular and sharing economy. By no accident, these aspects become the objects of the EU strategy for, for the Baltic Sea region. Poland has always been in favor of the creation of the common Baltic Sea space of cooperation. In very practical terms, it means merging of potential of different formats, among other, the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, the Council of the Baltic Sea States, HELCOM, the Northern Dimension, the Baltic Sea State sub-regional cooperation, and many others. But let me also draw your attention to one issue that is a serious point of concern for us and other nations living in Baltic Sea Basin. Unfortunately, the region has to face fading trust and security challenges due to one of our neighbor's misbehavior. Violation of airspace, provocative military maneuvers at sea, cyber threats, disinformation, using gas pipelines as tools of political domination, and the state of war in one in the neighboring Ukraine with the potential repercussions to the region contradict our ideals of cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, cohesion funds contribute to the development of our countries and bring tangible benefits to the whole region. As an example, let me focus on one particular area, protection of, of environment. We should not forget how vulnerable the marine ecosystem of the Baltic is. It is relatively shallow, closed, less salty, and less diverse than other seas. Therefore, it is more prone to various pressures and pollutions. The list of threats of the Baltic Sea is long. Hazardous substances and marine litter influx, as well as the climate change and poor status of marine biodiversity. We can fight with these threats by building awareness and developing cooperation. We can do it by developing scientific research actions on the local and macro-regional scale. I think that the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region may be a very good tool for mobilizing relevant stakeholders, including scientific institutions, entrepreneurs, and administration. Poland develops the in-house potential for the Polish maritime sector and cooperates with other countries on advancing international legal standards concerning the protection of the marine environment. Special attention should be paid to the chemical uh, munition dumped after the Second World War in the Baltic Sea. About 40,000 tons of chemical arsenal containing some 15,000 tons of, of chemical warfare agents lie on the seabed, posing a real threat to the marine ecosystem. This unwanted border needs to be tackled immediately. Ladies and gentlemen, today, there is no aspect of our life that does not have a digital component. Our hosts from e-Estonia know it best. We live in a world where digitalization has taken over social communication and altered the way we do business. Most importantly, the source of great economic growth for the Baltic Sea region lies in the development of the digital economy. Therefore, we must bring down all barriers to unlock online opportunities for business and consumers alike. The composition of the digital market is fierce and there is no time to waste. For our region, this means joining forces and creating a coherent digital ecosystem. Only by transforming the Baltic region into a digitally integrated economic organism, 
we will be able to compete with the global players. The key for unleashing the potential of the digital revolution in Europe is the development of 5G technology. This will be driving force of the digital economy. If we are to reap full benefits thereof, we have to make sure that technology can be deployed in the whole of the EU. The European Commission, as well as the EU member states, should act together to overcome external obstacles in the field of spectrum availability. Another major component of digital economy is data flows. With the growing number of internet automated devices, most economic sectors will need to have their own way of using data to their advantage. It should be viewed as the main catalyst of economic growth, innovation, and digitalization across economic sector. It is our duty to do everything to make sure that across that access to such data is facilitated. We want to cooperate with our partners from Baltic Sea region in order to build a strong digital market for Europe and explore to the maximum the possibilities it has to offer. Dear Baltic Sea friends, the ninth forum of the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region in Tallinn takes place on the brink of the new financial perspectives of the European Union. It creates opportunity to talk about ways of adapting the macro regional strategies to emerging challenges. I hope we will be able to develop fresh solution to our common concerns here in the charming city of Tallinn. I hope that we will capitalize on these innovative ideas during the next annual forum that will take place in Poland in the beautiful coastal city of Gdańsk. I wish you many fruitful meetings and discussion. Thank you, Minister. And I now would like to give the floor to European Commissioner for Regional Policy, Mrs. Corina Kretsu. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Prime Ministers, Ministers, Vice President Ansip, I don't know if he's here, my colleague. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my pleasure, of course, and my honor to be here today in Tallinn for uh, opening uh, uh, this session uh, uh, together with you, Excellencies, uh, for the ninth annual forum for the EU strategy for the Baltic uh, Sea region. And I would like, of course, starting by thanking the Estonian presidency for chairing this uh, strategy over the last year, and also the city of Tallinn for having us and for hospitality. I have always been convinced, I have uh, uh, now four years as Commissioner for Regional Policy, and uh, from the very beginning, I have convinced uh, uh, that uh, macro-regional strategies are Europe at its best. Regions from different countries uh, working together to tackle common challenges. The Baltic Sea strategy is the oldest uh, of the four macro-regional strategy, and uh, it's not for flattering, it's the most successful one. And I always give this Baltic uh, macro regional strategy as an example and as a, as a success story. The strategy has developed uh, innovative approaches to implement, um, to implement it, such as uh, flagship uh, lab label. And uh, it is not only an efficient way to monitor implementation, but also a way to identify projects or processes of high added value that can be used as examples. I know several projects uh, have been awarded as a flagship label, for example, on safer navigation. This is a very concrete cooperation with very concrete policy output and results. And this is what macro-regional strategy should be about. Building on this and looking towards the future, what I see uh, as a top priority is making sure that macro regions help improve the implementation of EU policies and territorial cohesion. 
This means that programs should not overlap and that support should not be fragmented. So having similar co coverage between macro-regional strategies and transnational cooperation should remain a key principle. Overall, this entails more streamlining, more simplification, and more focus on key priorities. And I have good hope that with a new legislative package for cohesion, we will get there. As you all know, it's quite a special moment now. Last week, the Commission presented its proposal for cohesion policy after 2020, including the Interreg. So you know very well that every time when uh, MFF, as we call now, we call it in the, our jargon in Brussels, multi-annual financial framework, every time it's creating a lot of emotions. And this time uh, was not business as usual. I had the pleasure to discuss with the Prime Minister do, uh, before about all the challenges that we have now, now Brexit and also new priorities. But uh, macro-regional strategies are very well placed in this new package as interreg programs play a crucial role in supporting transnational programs. So uh, let me say a few words about this package. Uh, first and foremost, as I said, I think we managed to secure a realistic and balanced budget. Cohesion policy has uh, 374 billion for 2021-2027 and remains a central investment tool for all European regions. We also want cohesion policy to have great added value. What we are proposing is a more focused approach with simpler de delivery mechanism. Simplification was a requirement fr from all the member states and I really think that it was time to change and now we have a, book, a single set of rules, a booklet for seven, uh, seven funds, which is 50, uh, it's half than what we have now in terms of pages of the regulations. So we have a shorter menu of priorities with fewer but broader policy objectives. And um, in this new setting, European territorial cooperation will continue to have a proeminent role. We are proposing to make uh, interregional cooperation a horizontal priority running through each policy objective. That's that why um, cooperation outside the area of any program will be much more easier. And we talk here about not only about simplification, but also about flexibility. We have also introduced specific tools such as interregional innovative investments to help member states and regions of different countries exploit the synergies of their respective smart specializations. Our proposal also features a specific regulation for a new mechanism to resolve legal and administrative obstacles in cross-border context. From now on, for instance, two countries can choose one legislation that suits the best uh, the countries because sometimes not only the, the language, for instance, it's much more easier to, to to cooperate between uh, Germany and Poland, but and harder between uh, Belgium and France, although they speak the same language because of the different uh, different uh, legislation. And from now on, they have to choose the best one that suits them. We are proposing to merge also maritime because I know that you are very uh, fond of this to merge maritime cross-border program with transnational cooperation. In, and the objective is to enhance maritime cooperation by doing it much more effectively and at the uh, appropriate level. Uh, as a result, the sea basin cooperation will allow combining basin-wide uh, basin actions with action meeting specific local needs. So there will be six basin programs, sea basin, sea basin programs, including one for the Baltic. We also want to simplify cooperation beyond EU borders. Now it's possible to have this cooperation outside the EU, so with regions outside the EU. We are putting forward the possibility to transfer resources from certain uh, external instruments, such uh, as the instrument for pre-accession or the European Neighborhood Instrument to be implemented by the Interreg Program authorities, and I think this is important, uh, especially for, uh, for Poland. Uh, these are, ladies and gentlemen, the main points I wanted to, to talk about. 
I would like to conclude uh, by underlining that macroregional strategies are not just about Interreg. All the relevant EU and national fund funding should be mobilized by the participating countries and their regions. This will ensure that adequate funding is available to implement the strategies. This, of course, requires continuous and active participation of the countries and, and regions involved in the strategies, but I'm not worried about your willingness. I, I, I know that I can count on your strong commitment to strengthen economic in integration and territorial cooperation. I would like to congratulate all of you. And uh, of course, I hope next year I will be still commissioner in Dansk. I, I wish you a fruitful forum. Thank you. Or maybe you'll invite me without being commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kretzo. That concludes the opening plenary. Plenty of food for thought, I would guess. I'm pleased to move on to the first plenary. And for that, I would like to invite to join me on the stage, Mr. Alexander Stubb, Mr. Konrad Szymanski, Kai Böhme, and Mr. Erik Bergquist. Now, Mr. Szymanski, I do understand you still need a microphone. It will be useful. So there is a gentleman over there who can provide you with one. Thank you very much. So, gentlemen, as um, some of the Prime Ministers are leaving, you are very welcome to take a seat. Thank you. Hello, sir. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, I'm Alex. So, I believe we have microphones for all the speakers. And we can begin. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we start this discussion, uh, you can also have a say using a hashtag EUSBSR after 2020. I know it's a bit lengthy, but it's, it should be here on the screen as well. Uh, now, when you use that in Twitter, your tweets will be displayed here on the screen. And during the very final minutes of this discussion, I will also take some questions using the more traditional method by passing uh, the microphone. But gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much for, for being here with us. Uh, Mr. Stoop, when you started or co-funded uh, the strategy in 2009, the, the MFF w had been agreed uh, two years ago, right? It was more or less locked. Now, as we begin the negotiations for the next uh, multi-annual financial framework, uh, do you think the region should actually push uh, more to get additional funding to implement the strategy uh, more successfully? Or is it more about micromanagement? What do you think? Am I speaking here as a banker or a former polit politician? <laughs> um, I remember that debate. As a matter of fact, it was nice to see the, the video with Thomas Silvis there. And, and, and sure, when we were members of the European Parliament, we pushed for the Baltic Sea strategy. Uh, and at the time, what we wanted to do was not to give it a specific uh, share of the budget, because we felt that that might sort of reduce its chances of being pushed through. But now, I mean, looking at the history of the Baltic Sea strategy and the way in which member states and regions jostle for money, I would say that, yes, uh, you, you, the member states, and especially in the Baltic Sea region, should be pushing uh, for a special uh, allotment uh, inside the budget. But of course, uh, as an EIB banker nowadays, I also say that there are a lot of good financial instruments that can be used uh, under the umbrella as, as well. But my answer would be yes. So the three core principles, the three no's, might mm. even be uh, revised? I think so. I mean, I, I actually think that the strategy has been a success. And, and I, I do thank everyone uh, coming over here. And the basic idea at the time was not so much to push for a money machine, but to create awareness about the region. Because, you know, if you look at per capita, this is one of the richest regions uh, in Europe. If you look at uh, innovation, if you look at technological development, 
yeah, we do quite well in this region. Uh, and the basic aim was obvious to get more attention to our beloved sea, which, you know, as you said, 10 years ago, wasn't looking like that. You can and actually see through the you jar You can see now, through yeah. it. And I mean, I, when I was a kid, we used to travel around in the Baltic Sea. We had a little, you know, putt-putt boat. We did that for four weeks uh, every summer, island hopping, basically, in the Finnish archipelago. And at that time, I'm born 1968, um, at that time, it was possible to see the bottom of the sea, but then something happened and it really, you know, it got gunky, it got disgusting, it got green, it was full of phosphates, uh, a lot of agricultural stuff, uh, a lot of environmental pollution. But I, I think, you know, the Baltic Sea strategy raised awareness and, and, and now we are where we are. One of the things that was mentioned there earlier, if I recall correctly, uh, it takes about 30 years for a drop of water to enter the Baltic Sea and then leave it. Uh, and if the average depth of the Baltic Sea is roughly about 50, 52 meters, you know, a little bit of an environmental catastrophe, and that's it. Now people understand and see the region, and I, I think uh, we've done a good job. There's a tap, by the way, for everyone who doesn't, there's a tap <laughs> on that thing. I, I would still advise against drinking. That's, uh, that's a good uh, reminder. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, considering yeah. of saying that myself. What, what, but what's this stuff, by that. the way? That's okay. that's clean. Oh, right, that's okay. clean. Okay. That okay. that <laughs> doesn't come from 200 meters from that way. Okay. That, that's, that's yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Shimanski, when you look at the proposal, the Commission table just last week on uh, on cohesion funds, are you confident that the EU uh, SBSR will be able to move ahead with greater pace, or are you rather worried? No, I'm deeply worried with the proposition because uh, when you look at the MFF uh, draft proposition in light of our discussion about the future of the EU strategy for Baltic member states for Baltic region, it looks that all member states represented here uh, are affected deeply by uh, quite substantial cuts. And by the way, we are talking about still the poorest member states in the club. So it's hard to defend the proposition and it's hard to say that it's balanced the, in case of proposition which propose to sell, um, to send even more money to the richer countries and cut even more money uh, in case of uh, the poorest country. Of course, we are very proud of the dynamic of convergence and convergence in our countries, all Latvia, um, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland uh, is, uh, is amazing. We did it with a lot of support from the EU. We did it with our own uh, efforts, domestic efforts, uh, bringing a responsible fiscal policy already mentioned by a Lithuanian prime minister by the structural reforms, not present in every corner of the EU. So we are proud of this, uh, of this uh, convergence effect. It is in case of Poland 68%, it, it, it is right direction and quite dynamic. But it doesn't mean that the convergence is already completed. And it doesn't mean that it, it changed something dramatically in terms of the list of the GDP per capita, which is the most relevant aspect, how to read the economic and socio-economic uh, development. So yes, we expect a serious compromise. We are ready to create with our partners a more serious compromise also to make uh, strategies like the Baltic strategy um, feasible. Um, we need ambitious strategy here and it's impossible to, to implement um, ambitious strategy without money. It is, it is simple as that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Burma, in a well, rather timely study uh, <laughs> that Special Foresight uh, just published, uh, EOSBSR after 2020 governance remastered, I hope everyone here has already read it. If not, you're very welcome to do so. You highlighted a structural problem, uh, comparing the strategy with a vehicle with many passengers, but rather unclear who is the driver. Now, this is something that I actually read from previous reports dating back uh, to 2014. Now, why do you think this issue has remained unsolved? Well, I think on the one hand, it's an issue that remains unsolved and probably will so for a long while because the idea of the Baltic Sea strategy was to get everybody on board. So from the very beginning, with the three nodes, you basically made sure you don't point at 
a specific organization, a specific fund, a specific piece of regulation to say that is to implement you, but you want to have the buy-in from a very large group of people from different cities, different regions, different countries, all of them contributing, because the challenge that the Baltic Sea region faces can only be solved in cooperation, will not be able to solve them in an individual city, region, country, whatever you want. So from that side, I think the point was always to get everybody on board, but then it becomes very complex in terms of governance systems. And here, I think the main challenge is at the moment to make sure that those people that have the energy to drive and kind of keep on kicking the eyes and saying, you promised to do that, please also follow up on that. And that is where I at the moment see a little bit the challenge with the growing complexity of the governance system and the huge buy-in, which is a very positive effect, so don't underestimate that. But we need to make sure that there are also a few people that really make sure it continues and it yeah, keeps adjusting and keeps running and keeps the pace. And there we have in our report presented a few ideas how some possible simplification, some possible changes might help to get a little bit more dynamic and give those people that have the resources back at home. Because all of the people engaged in the politics strategy have a lot of things to do. It's not that that is the only thing at their desk. And giving those that have more resources possibility to take a little bit more of a driver's seat and move forward. Well, you interviewed a lot of people when you uh, wrote your paper. Does it seem that there's political will to actually reform the structures? Or is it an ongoing story that we will come back to in, uh, in 10 years? Well, I think in one hand, there is, it will be an ongoing story and hopefully come back to that in 10 years, because that means we still have all those people on board. And we keep on discussing how to move forward the best way because there is not this one clear-cut solution to it. So from that side, I think having that at the agenda means we have very many people that are interested to contribute, and that is a good thing. So from that side, yes, it will remain there, but I think there's also a political interest to make sure that things are running efficiently and efficient, in particular kind of in times where budget restrictions in some parts becoming more and more delicate. I think there is need to make sure that we use the resources we have the best way possible. Mr. Bergqvist, uh, do you agree with the critics who say that the strategy is simply trying to focus on too many policy areas and it should be consolidated? Now, I think Mr. Rattas also mentioned this in his uh, opening speech mm -hmm. that uh, we should focus on areas that actually make a difference. Is it politically feasible to merge some of the priorities, I think there are 17 uh, policy areas right now, right? Well, well that's, that's always the discussion and always my experience when we start to do any kind of strategic document. We need to be focused. And then the more people we talk to, and everyone says we need to be focused, but then suddenly we realize we want to focus on, on different things. And I think that's the same thing with, with the, the Baltic Sea strategy. It is as focused as can be. And by merging, well, unless you, you take away options, the merging will just be well, less areas, but broad, broader areas. So I think we should always try to, to focus, but we have to realize that in the end, there are a lot of things that are important. And just to focus on what's effective is, well, it's something we should say and of course discuss, but it's just afterwards, you know, what was really effective in that sense. But, but I think that that's one thing that actually could and should be developed. How do we form and how do we communicate in the process of recreating the Baltic Sea strategy? Because that's one of the most important things every time you make a strategy, because you've done it. Well, the strategy is finished, it's a kind of a dead document. Of course, we can use it and we will use it as a platform. But the process of involving people on the way is, in my experience, most often the most valuable part of the work because then people can see that this is our own region and this is how we together actually develop that. Gentlemen, the next MFF uh, negotiations, what 
I mean, some have said will likely be the most difficult ones in uh, in the history of the European Union uh, pose several challenges. I mean, there's a cut uh, of cohesion funds. At the same time, there's more flexibility of using those funds also in macro-regional strategies. What is the way forward that you see that we, w w while heading to these negotiations, what should the region push for? A similar question I asked Mr. Stubb earlier on. Is there a need to push for more, let's say, common understanding that uh, structural funds, cohesion funds should be used, should be perhaps pooled uh, by, by, by member states and used together to tackle the common challenges? Should the region fight for uh, new instruments? Gentlemen, I think let's start with, uh, with Mr. Szymanski. Yes, I think uh, we face a very fundamental discussion uh, about the very nature of cohesion policy. Because I frequently hear, especially in some capitals, that it is a kind of aid policy, a kind of one-way aid policy, where the division line between the benefactors and, and beneficiaries, donors and receivers, are very clear. It is obviously not true. The cohesion creates convergence, and convergence means uh, economic growth, which creates an enormous added value for those economies which are integrated in terms of trade. And the role of the trade, intra-EU trade, in some economies, especially in the North, which is so reluctant in this case, is, is obvious. It is, uh, according to our estimation, probably four or maybe five times more than transfers uh, in, in this part of the budget. So it is worth doing, I would say. It is not an aid policy, it's an investment policy, which proved to be open for reforms. And here we are as well. We are open to reform this policy because even today we could deliver a lot of good results on all aspects of so-called progressive policies, on environment, climate change, energy um, integration, uh, on innovation, and of course investments, which works well for the whole internal market. We have to dismantle this populist approach uh, frequently repeated by both pro-European populist and anti-European populist, that cohesion policy is old-fashioned, passive, non-investment, one-way policy. Without this particular debate, an in-depth debate about the role and real nature of this policy, probably we will be in a, in a real uh, problem because, uh, of, of course, the map of interest when we see the preliminary first rounds of discussion uh, at the council level uh, about the MFF, the map of interest is exactly the same as it was seven years ago. But all participants are, has much stronger position. It means, of course, that the compromise is less available than it was before. It is historically uh, probably the most, indeed, um, challenging negotiations. But we have to be serious. We, we can't agree this, this logic I mentioned, um, this uh, bad PR of cohesion policy in the European debate. Mr. Stubb wanted to comment. Yeah, I guess, I mean, the, the first, I'm, I'm a really sad case because I, I've been involved in the MFF negotiations for the first time in Agenda 2000, actually 1999, uh, as a civil servant. Then in 2007, as a member of the European Parliament, Conrad and I were MEPs at the same time. Then uh, the third time, 2014, as a Minister for European Affairs, and now uh, as a banker uh, and, and uh, at the EIB. And, and my only piece of advice, uh, if I would put it into one word, please de-dramatize. Uh, there's a sense that every time we have an MFF, this becomes a larger the life issue. And of course, when we negotiate about money, it's always difficult. There are always emotions running high. There are always uh, calculations being made. But keep in mind that the overall size of the EU budget is 1% of the GNI of the whole area. If you look at government budgets pending on the country, uh, they are between 25 to 35% of GDP of a certain area. The redistributive value of the European Union is important, but still 
uh, limited. Now, having said that, am I trying to talk down the importance of the MFF? No, I'm not. But one piece of advice I would give is that if and when we have diminishing resources, say because of Brexit or because of a lesser appetite to pump money into the European Union and then redistribute among member states, think about the second best option, which is financial instruments and budget guarantees. And what do I mean by that? I mean the types of instruments that we've been using with EFSI or the Juncker plan, where basically the European Investment Bank and the European Commission put down a guarantee and provide loans which then generate more money to the area. These are not away from the grants and subsidies, they are in addition to it. And basically the slogan that we use is do more with less or have more uh, bang for the buck. And I, I think that's the direction in, in which we're going to go. Mr. Uh, Mr. Bergqvist and then Mr. Berma, uh, do you, I mean, is there a problem that uh, clever flagship projects or processes are fighting to get money and are often turned down? And is there a solution for that, either uh, by pooling resources or by using the flexibility of the uh, next MFF that we were talked about? Mm -hmm. uh, this is my third uh, program period I'm experiencing as uh, uh, active on the regional level after 2020 will be my fourth. Uh, and one experience I think is general, both for flagship projects and all kinds of projects is that, and I'm almost afraid to say the word because it's been said so often, we have to simplify. Uh, and everyone has said that for the last three program periods. And our experience is it hasn't been easier. It has been more and more difficult and more and more bureaucratic. Have you read the proposal from the Commission that came out last week? Is it yes, convincing? Uh, no. Well, from what we can see, we've, we interpret it's, it's good. Of course, there's less money. What, what else to expect in a way? But I think the reasoning that we should have a cohesion policy for all of Europe, that we should have this toolbox that everyone in a way can use, but it will be used differently. Uh, and also that it will be simpler and also based on your track record, it might be, be even simpler. We think that's good news, but the devil is always in the details. So it's first when we see what will the final writings be that we will know, will this be easier? And I th think this is also very important for the Baltic Sea strategy because we can choose to, to give money explicit to, to this, or we can say we can use other fundings, pool it together to do other things, but also to pool it in the Baltic Sea strategy. But then this has to be possible. Today, you're not living a good life if you try to do this on a local level, because it's so really, really complicated. So, so I, what I think we should try everyone to remember when we now continue to negotiate, uh, form the rest of the details, think that every development happens locally. Someone out there is doing this and will try to work with these programs. How are we making their life easier? Because we want action and the people out there are the ones doing this action. So I think if you remember that, then we will have a much better Baltic Sea strategy and how we can use the money in the MFF. So if you remember one thing from myself, everything happens locally. How can we make that happen? Mr. Burma. Okay, maybe traveling further on those parts that have just been said, for me there are four key points. On the one hand, I think we shouldn't only look at kind of cohesion policy and the funds within that, but we should look really at all possible contributions, including financial instruments that can be used in different ways also for the Baltic Sea strategy. So really don't look at only specific types of programs, specific type of funds, but on everything. And I think then for all the different types of funding mechanisms, we should use the flexibility that at the moment seems to be there and say, for the future, we want all of them to have at least an opening to support territorial cooperation of different types so that they can more easily be used across yeah. territories, be it as one in a single country or across national borders. I think then the third point that we kind of had in the report as 
probably a rather distant future, but maybe if we take the speeches from the opening session and the very high political commitment, maybe there is some hope that if we think about the instruments that we have at European level, there's one that's called integrated territorial investments, which requires a strategy and different funds say, okay, we want to support that strategy. We put a little part of our money to that strategy. If we go very wild and crazy, we could even imagine such an ITI at the level of the macro-regional strategy, which would allow very many different contributors into one instrument without establishing a new fund that can be handled and support different kinds of projects. And finally, first point, moving to kind of flagship projects, for me, there also needs to be a balance between those very concrete flagship projects that we see often today, which are kind of concrete actions happening locally, and the Baltic Sea strategy actually also as a strategy where we coordinate policy making to make sure that we have similar answers to the same challenges across the different countries and we can make sure that our policies and regulations across the countries are aligned that things can happen. So it's both kind of the project and the process side and we need to make sure that's happening as well. Perhaps just as a follow-up, uh, to be more precise, this MITI, right, that you were uh, writing about in the report, I found it very interesting. Could it actually be an, a real budget for the strategy and like a budget that could support some kind of a new institution, perhaps, uh, bringing the strategy forward? Well, I think if you really take that idea forward and saying it's not just a crazy idea, but it can be done and there's enough commitment behind it. It would mean that a number of funds from different funding sources, different countries, different programs would join this instrument and put money in there. And that money can be used within the strategy where there is some kind of decision-making body to distribute it for concrete projects, but also for facilitating the management of the strategy. So in a way, it would be a possibility to get something like a funding for the strategy, but yeah, really based on the buy-in of a very large number of different funding programs. And that's, I think, the point where it might take more than the next couple of months or a year to negotiate the buy-in, which makes it more tricky. Perhaps we can come back to the administrative uh, part now that we've uh, discussed uh, the, the money question already. Now, several reports have noted that measuring progress is something to be improved actually with, uh, with all the macro-regional strategies. But uh, the study that Mr. Burma's Spatial Foresight put forward also highlighted an internal communication challenge. Now, some participants apparently are still a bit in the dark um, concerning their formal position within the, the framework. Now, what could be done to slim down the several layers of working parties that often coexist together with, uh, with limited coordination? And, um, I mean, what are the, the challenges fixing it? I mean, I understand everyone wants to stay focused, but there's just too many people who have different focuses, right? So, Mr. Szymanski. No, I think it's... Uh it's a question, uh, the administrative burden, the bureaucratic mess, which it, it is a question which, uh, which is present in almost all European discussions because it's a matter of fact that we have a very sophisticated and complicated decision-making processes. But uh, I can uh, subscribe to these concerns, but what I would like to protect in this whole reform approach is the bottom-up approach uh, and this multi-layer sometimes boring or problematic or complicating the aspect of the decision making also in, in this strategy um, creates also uh, a kind of ownership and legitimization. So I can say yes, we, we probably we should streamline uh, many things, but not at the expense of this, not at the expense of ownership, not at the expense of legitimization of the process because it would be um, a substitution of one problem with another, maybe even more profound. So I don't know how far we can go with this reform approach to secure the, the very nature of strategy of today. Mm -hmm. But the question of ownership that you very correctly highlighted, I mean, this 
is also uh, brought out, the, the report brought this out as one of the, the questions as well. I mean, you do have activists who are very, uh, very keen on achieving uh, concrete results, but still there's a question of uh, political will on the, the higher level, perhaps, on the coordination level of ministries. Uh, now, I understand Sweden uh, has the coordinator on uh, the prime minister's office, or at least close to the prime minister's office. Has that uh, changed the game? Would, is this something that you would recommend to, uh, to other uh, participating countries? Uh, well, uh, it, it, it depends. We can see now that the negotiations are coordinated from, from the prime minister's uh, office, uh, but then when it comes to, well, when all this is done, we are quite decentralized in in Sweden, and much of the decision making is made on the regional level because we can see that the national level is too far away. Even within Sweden, it's the the country so heterogeneous, so you can't say that we can use this policy on a national level. So we have regional plans, regional programs. Uh, uh, and of course, we are the in between the regional level, between the local, the national, and we also have quite a lot of contact with the with the with the EU level. So what I think we we need to do, and we can do that much more in Sweden as well. We need to be true multi-level governance when we do action and when we think, because if we can't get these levels to work together, not necessarily all levels all the time, but if we can't get them to work together, it will be hard to get the job work done locally because the local level don't have either the network or sometimes not even the resources. It has to be coordinated sometimes with the regional level and sometimes with the national or EU level. So I think the regional level is a national spider in the net. And the more decision making you can put, of course, on a political level so you can also demand responsibility on a regional level, I think the more bang you will get for the buck, even when it comes within a nation but also between, because we can also see that it's regions that work together around the Baltic Sea. So, so dare to, to do that in, in Sweden and other Baltic Sea countries. Dare to trust the regional level, and then you will get a lot more out for every uh, cent, penny, or whatever currency you use. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stubb. Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky question. At the end of the day, I think the, the original thought of the Baltic Sea strategy, I mean, a lot of the arguments that we used at the time was to say that, you know, there are over 20 different players that are dealing with the Baltic Sea region. There is not enough coordination. We have a lot of goodwill and a lot of good ideas, but nothing is happening. Uh, and I think we started a little bit, probably not from the bottom up as we should have. We started a bit from the top down with the thinking that, okay, now the whole Baltic Sea region is basically uh, bordered and covered by uh, EU member states. And then we also thought that even you know, Chancellor Angela Merkel has been born and raised by the Baltic Sea. So this gives ownership, took the Orland Islands into it and, and, and the rest of it. And then after that, we thought, okay, how could we deal with it? Let's do a strategy and let's define a few key areas. We define security and, well, we define actually environment, uh, economy, security, these types of things. But for regular people, it's, it's not so much, you know, the issue of, how this is coordinated, who is doing what. It's all about results. It's all about we feeling. So, you know, when we get work done on a wastewater plant in St. Petersburg, and there's clear results that as a result of that, the water is cleaner. Or if we uh, limit the use of phosphates in farming, and as a result of that, you know, it's cleaner. Then I think people get more interested in, in the whole idea, but we, and I say this, you know, as, as a bureaucrat, we have a tendency to get a little bit too excited about the bureaucratic form of things rather than the way in which it's, it's done. And, and just the fact that the Baltic Sea strategy, you know, we're meeting here for the ninth time, is getting results, I think, is a, is a, is a good thing. There's one thing where I disagree a little with, with Mr. Bergquist, but perhaps this is our approach, is you said all things are local. Let's see how to make them happen. I, I think all things are global, and then we <laughs> see how they happen. And I think mm. the Baltic Sea strategy is global, but where I think he's absolutely right, the implementation is local. Yeah. But then we agree, yes. I think. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, a lot of emphasis in the report has uh, been put on the need to be flexible, to be bold, to take uh, courageous decisions and also to take into account the changing environment, regional, global trends. And uh, well, challenges are like the Paris Climate Agreement or the UN Urban Agenda. Is there real movement uh, to make uh, the strategy more flexible? But I would say the strategy has been from day one pretty much flexible and saying it's not a fixed strategy that is set out and now has to be rolled out, but it has from day one on being a focus on evolving and saying, well, if there are new challenges, if they are developing new foci, then the strategy adjusts. And I think that's one of the big strengths of that strategy, is that it keeps the flexibility to adjust to emerging both challenges and potential. And the main point is saying, okay, there are a number of challenges <coughs> that are emerging, which we need to think about. And maybe some of them will then also again result in some of the priority or actions changing over the next years. So I think for me, the strategy is one of the prime examples of a policy that is built to be able to adjust to changing contexts. And that is a big strength. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I would like to test one more idea from the from the report, uh, as I've obviously been reading it a lot in the past uh, days. And <laughs> uh, so, one of the ideas is to um, strengthen the role of steering groups or committees in the government governing uh, structures. Now, Mr. Burma, could you elaborate on this a bit? I mean, I understand this is something that doesn't. Uh, it's not a destroy very the bottom up kind of uh, approach, but uh, rather like but enforces the activists. What you have to see in, in order to get all the relevant players on board in the strategy, there have been uh, involvement of different groups and groupings that need to be part of it in order to make sure the competence or the decision making power, the ownership gets included. And that's kind of also what you hinted at earlier, where we have a feeling maybe. For some people, it's getting too complex, and they have to go to these meetings, they have to attend that, they have to do that. But they don't always have kind of the resources back at home to spend so much time on this and to do that. And actually would rather like to do concrete things instead of getting all that coordination. That's where we believe if we maybe get a little bit less formalistic and saying we don't need to have all the very formal committees and groupings, but I'd rather say we can imagine some kind of partnerships, a little bit like it is done in the urban agenda, the urban policies in Europe. Saying, well, if we have such concern and everybody that believes that this is really important and I can make a contribution, be it from a city, from a region, from a ministry, from a state organization somewhere, can come together and work on that, rather than going to, well, I have to apply for a flagship and I have to make sure I sit in that committee. So that this is more of saying, can we become more flexible and get the ownership of those people that really want to make a contribution without overburdening things in formal structures? And also by that, maybe become a little bit more flexible or relaxed on saying that in every kind of part of the structure, there needs to be somebody from all kinds of levels and all kinds of countries, but rather say, okay, for certain topics that might be more relevant for certain administrative levels mm -hmm. or certain countries, and then in that partnership they can move forward. So Do that's my little bit the idea, and saying mm -hmm. that overcomes also the problems that some of the groups that exist, which are hardly known but do a lot of the hard work, are invisible and kind of sometimes people perceive them as burden burdening to them. Could that work, Mr. Bergqvist? Is that the right direction? Uh, yes, I'm all for that. Make it easier for the ones doing the, the hard work. Uh, and that's why I think also we have to, to make uh, decision makers as, as, as long, as spot, f f low as possible, because otherwise it won't be possible, because then you have to have all this level you have to, to travel through to actually give this, this freedom and less bu bureaucracy in that sense. So I'm, I'm all for that. But it's long time processes. For example, now it's the ninth uh, forum we are, we are having here. And I would say in the recent years, we have been starting to know how to cooperate quite well. 
Uh, and the thing is, it's, it's, it's never authorities that cooperate, it's always people that cooperate. And it takes time to know which one to talk to, because you don't go to authority and knock on the door and say, I have a project. Yeah. You go to a person. And if you know that person, or if the person knows the subject, then it's much, much easier. So it's that kind of process also we have to think, how can we make them happen faster? Uh, now we have a managing authorities network for the managing authorities. Now we're thinking, and we're having actually a seminar here today, later, how can we in smart specialization work together in networks among the regions actually to make this be easier and, and happen much, much more faster. So make it easier, but uh, beware of the details so you don't make it harder. So gentlemen, how can we make those flagship uh, projects and processes that everyone notices it being it the cleaner jar on that corner of the uh, the stage with the the sea uh, inside a bit uh, say uh, cleaner ships uh, how like is that a question of communication which i slightly doubt is that a question of um, prioritizing uh, getting the lesser funds behind uh, the more important uh, projects mr shimanski can you share your ideas probably one of the obstacles is the fact that the baltic uh, sea uh, against the stereotype isn't surrounded by uh, only eu countries and it affects a lot of policies uh, and our possible uh, intra-EU convergence of policies, be it environmental, climate or security or uh, infrastructure, uh, isn't shared by our non-EU partners. Uh, probably here we have a major obstacle. So we should... Uh cooperate with third countries, namely Russia, I believe, is what you're hinting at. You need a cooperative approach from that side to cooperate. Of course, we are ready, but we know what kind of obstacles we face in, in this yeah. respect. Yeah, you know, I remember, I mean, I think when we were pushing the strategy forward, there was a certain skepticism, actually, from the Russian side, because the northern dimension was up and running uh, at the time and they were sort of basking you know what is this is this just an eu thing and and there was certain skepticism but then when i think the russians and and many europeans as well saw that these should not be juxtaposed against each other then things started running and from what i understand this is just a wild guess i think the sanctions have not affected the baltic sea strategy or the cooperation that we do with Russia, nor the northern dimension as, as, as such. So in that sense, it's been work that, that's, that's gone quite well uh, under the radar. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, let's see what happens in the future. I mean, I, 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 still, think, I still think, and as the commissioner said, that this, this was actually the first regional strategy inside the European Union. I think the Donau strategy came afterwards. Okay. And, so on and so forth. It has been quite successful, but I still believe that, that I think money, to be honest, um, is, is the issue. Uh, you know, anytime you have a clear allocation of budgetary resources or money somewhere, then people start looking at it from a different kind of a perspective. Um, and, and perhaps that could activate things a, a little bit. Uh, and that's why I'm perhaps sitting on the fence, but pushing for the direction of uh, budgetary resources for the Baltic Sea strategy in the next MFF. Do you think that's realistic? I don't know. What's realistic in an MFF negotiation? <laughs> um, I mean, it hasn't been proposed uh, for, as far as I know. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's basically the eight Baltic Sea uh, states will have to sit down, get together and say, is this worth doing or not? The fear, the problem here is that the MFF is purely an intergovernmental negotiation. And every member state around the Baltic Sea, it's jostling for its own position. So if they see some kind of a trade-off with, okay, if we eight go to the commission and say, we need money for the Baltic Sea strategy, is that away from my uh, allotted resources? And that's probably where the realism uh, comes into, into play. I mean, there are clearly several interests and rather different approaches around the Baltic states. Uh, or, yeah, around, sorry, around the, the Baltic Sea. Uh, but uh, when you look at when, 
when when one uh, macro regional strategy starts asking money, three will follow, pretty likely. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, if you want to really simplify, you have, for all intents and purposes, four cohesion countries and then four net contributors. So this might be something that makes it a little bit complicated. At the same time, I would argue that we have eight fairly technologically advanced countries who could you know, focus a lot on innovation, research and, and development. But this is what makes the whole package, uh, I think, quite difficult. And that's why it might be difficult to get an own budgetary uh, resource allotted in the MFF for the Baltic Sea uh, strategy. But then, don't worry, every member state has a completely schizophrenic <laughs> position on the MFF, you know. It never makes sense if you try to put all the different things into an algorithm and say, you know, and ask someone, what is the MFF about? I just say it's pure chaos, yeah. you know. <laughs> That's, that wraps yeah. it up pretty well, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Burma. I think I agree on your mm. point there, but also that kind of if you would have a budget for the strategy, it definitely would get more attention. But for me, it's also a question whether such a budget line wouldn't even pose a risk to the strategy. Because once I have a delicated budget line, be it in the mm -hmm. multi-annual financial framework, or be it that we take one of the Interact projects and turn it strategy, I would fear that a lot of the other players say, well, fine, now you have a budget line and now I don't need to care about that anymore in my funding. So what was mentioned earlier is this kind of network of managing authorities would suddenly say, well, why should we network and do something if there is a delegated budget, then it should be done under that budget and we use our budget for our purposes. So in a way, I see the beauty of a budget, but I also see the risk that it actually my lowers level of buy-in and commitment to the strategy by other players. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit of double-sided sword mm -hmm. to me. The, the debate hasn't changed in 10 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Berquist wanted to add. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about case. I remember when I, I studied some, some chaos theory on my PhD studies, but but the thing was, in deterministic case at least, it was case. But then you could pretty much say where you would end up in an interval, of course. And I think that will be the same here. At least I hope so, that because it's not a revolution we are doing. We are doing some kind of evolution with, with this, this budget. Uh, and I think if we just remember where we're going, we're, we're trying to, to, to build this, this thing called Europe t together in a way. And if we want to keep that and want development and welfare in all Europe, then the thing is we need to meet and we need to create programs that both of course create action but also gives us a possibility to work together all across Europe and the easier that that is the, the faster we will will get a Europe that can uh, talk and, and work together in a much better way than today and th that I think in that sense the Baltic Sea strategy is a, a success this is the ninth time we're meeting here and we wouldn't meet here if we didn't have this strategy for one thing and uh, all these decision maker or influencers as i've heard it's called nowadays uh, we wouldn't meet and it wouldn't happen a lot of things around the baltic sea if we weren't have these tools to to cooperate so i think it's the most is still to be done but it has been a success so far i think the, the if, if i may that i mean I think one, of, one of the nice things with the baltic sea strategy is that i mean if you think about the European Union, 28 member states and its history and the rest of it, I think right now we're seeing a mega trend of, of regionalization mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And I mean regionalization in a broad sense. So a lot of people are trying to simplify the European Union by a set of divisions. So, you know, north-south division is on the economy or on the euro. East-west division is, you know, on, say, asylum or, or immigration. Um, or sometimes it can be an east-west on, 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 on climate change. So people are trying to find these sort of simple formulas. Then you look at the eight countries around the Baltic Sea region. You know, five of them are in the Euro, uh, three are not. You know, um, one is a founding state, two have come a little bit, three have come a little bit later, and then the, there are some newcomers. And, he, and some of them are big, some of them are small, some of them are medium-sized. And suddenly you're getting quite an interesting coalition working for the same purpose, which is to try to basically get a stable, clean, sound uh, Baltic Sea region. And I, I quite like this cooperation. And, and, and sometimes I think it could be useful to plant a bit of EU money into it. And 
And the argument that then other players will drop out, I hope that would not be the case because it should be, you know, open cooperation type. And, you know, it shouldn't be exclusive in, in any way. Um, by the way, there's another interesting, I don't know, Conrad, do you remember from the European Parliament times, we had the big vodka wars. Uh, and, and we were trying to define, you know, uh, what vodka should be made of and should not. And we had a great coalition among seven uh, out of the eight Baltic Sea regions, <laughs> countries, Germany wasn't there. And the reason was very simple, because these seven countries both produce and consume over 50% of the vodka in the region. Uh, so, you know, that was a you know, binding effect, if you will. Something to build on, perhaps, in Something Brussels. Something to build on, I say, I say cheers on that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Szymanski, you go to Brussels to the meetings uh, very frequently. Do you think uh, this could be sold, this idea of uh, having a dedicated budget line for the uh, strategy? Well, for the moment, uh, we haven't such an idea on the table. I noticed uh, some uh, uh, sceptical remarks made by those who are much closer to the execution of the strategy than me, so I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, remark. I don't know if it's uh, the, the real trigger behind the successful Baltic strategy. Probably the amount of money is more important than the financial lines because we can imagine it, it is a reform oriented approach to this hard negotiations. We can imagine different forms of uh, financial support for many different angles of this strategy. So I think the formal aspects are not uh, the most important. Ladies and gentlemen, I wonder if uh, you have questions. Uh, there is tweets being displayed on, on, the, on the screen here. I, uh, I can't read them very well. So if you, have, uh, if you prefer to ask your question using the more traditional means by, well, asking it using a microphone, could you please uh, raise your hand so I can see you? Is there any? Everything is clear. Crystal clear. Crystal clear. It's, it's all crystal clear, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind. Oh, there's a question over there. There is one. Wonderful. Hello. Um, sorry, we joined a bit uh, later, the conversation. Um, but there were some, uh, some of the points that I took with me directly is that we're here to do evolution, not revolution. And it's exactly what, uh, for me, the strategy is about. Uh, I'm managing one of the projects within the policy area education, and um, we're funded by the European Social Fund. And uh, I could say from the practitioner part who works with the European Social Fund, and we are a, a clearly, totally transnational project, we have just... Um, a simple uh, difficulty to involve our stakeholders, our partners, because of this transna transnational part is not really working in practice. So my question is uh, to you, with your experience and your knowledge, how, what are the pra practical steps uh, for the structural funds to be more used uh, as they should be used for the transnational cooperation? Thank you. Good question. Any other questions that we could assemble? No? Well, gentlemen, who wishes to uh, answer that? Shall I? Well, I, I think your experience sounds very familiar to me, that a lot of the non-cross-border, non-transnational funds are very much focused on spending the money within the programming area they have, and then there are kind of two different ways. Either you say, well, I combine funds from different programs in order to cover the area I want to cover, and you end up in quite an exercise on coordinating applications, processes, and being successful in all of that. And well, some have been quite successful in that. Others say, well, uh, Kai, don't ask me those questions because that usually is a lot of hassle. There's also a way where actually the programs are allowed to spend a certain proportion of their money outside their programming area. So that you could apply for one ESF program and say, well, we have partners in different countries and we will want to use that share of our budget to support those partners so that you don't need to create 
tons of different applications and different funds. Unfortunately, that part is not as frequently used and the programs are not as happy to always think about that solution as one would like to wish. And therefore, kind of my plea also for the next round of programs to really make sure that every program has built that opportunity in and can support projects that want to go beyond their country or their programming area. That could make it a little bit easier, but I agree, it is not as straightforward as one would like to have it. Mr. Berkvist. Yeah, if we look now in, on paper at least, the uh, cooperation possibilities are, are quite, quite good. Uh, but what it fails to is sometimes people don't know how to do it. And as we can experience, has been working with this for, for 15 years, we can see it has not been easier. And once you've learned how to do it, then it suddenly becomes a little harder. So try to um, very carefully and have a good dialogue with the ones that, that will do it in the end. How can we make the, the current system and usage of these fundings easier? Uh, and also don't have a different formula or bureaucracy for, for each uh, funding. Make, make it, uh, keep it, uh, kiss they say, keep it simple, stupid. Try to make it as uh, similar as possible. And, and also I think it's a question about information because today you have a transnational component, but quite many are not aware of this. And this is already today quite easy to use. But make the current systems easier to use uh, and have information how they can be used. And then I don't think we need so much new things, just make the ones we have usable. Mr. Stubb. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess in my previous job, I, 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 I learned one trick, and that was to say, that, you know, uh, uh, have an intervention, but don't ask the question, but pitch your own case, right? <laughs> and I, I'll try to do that, because I mean, I, just a thought that came from your question is, so if you look at the EIB, the European Investment Bank, I mean, I don't know how many of you know the bank as, as, as such. Um, we've existed for 60 years and we're the EU's bank, so owned by the 28 member states. And we're also the biggest multilateral bank in the world. We are three times bigger than the World Bank and, and 10 times bigger than the EBRD. Now, the reason I say this is I'm thinking, well, if and when we're the EU's bank and we have four areas, which are SMEs, innovation, infrastructure, and climate and environment. <coughs> Why should not some actors, whether public or private, in the Baltic Sea region, who need financial instruments and loans, come and knock on our door and say, listen, we have this major project, could you come and help and finance this? This is obviously not direct grant money because we don't do grants, but we give rather competitive loans and financial instruments. So, you know, you guys need to be innovative as well when, when, when you look at these things and, 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 and see what you can, we can do. I'm looking at the audience. If anyone has a question, I would gladly uh, take one. I have several uh, prepared myself, but this should be democracy, right? <laughs> Everyone should have a say. <laughs> Maybe I'll just conclude then, if I don't see any hands, modest people, everything's clear, good moderating, good panelists. Uh, there's one question. There's a question over there. Okay, wonderful, good. Uh, just, may I just ask you to introduce yourself and uh, the microphone is coming your way. Yeah, hi, my name is Peter Volkovinsky. I'm a lead expert for two Urbac projects, but I'm also the moderator of the Do Nothing Without Us workshop this evening um, on what the role of young people can be in, in, the, in all this. And I would like to ask you all a question which is a political question. At the moment we seem to be in a moment when um, lots of voting in lots of countries is going in a particular way. We had the Slovenian results this morning. Um, how can what everything that you say, which is which is technical approach, which is the chaos that you were talking about, Mr. Stubb, in terms of the MMF, how can we translate that to Joe Bloggs, who walks on, on his feet on the street and, and give him the feeling that Europe means something? Because yeah. I'm not sure that we're actually talking to people in the language that they understand. We're talking some other kind of language. So um, my question is, how do we translate that into political concepts which win rather than get stampeded on? Thank you very much. Anyone else? 
or shall we take this very important question, which goes back a long way, I think. Mr. Mr. Burma, you can start. But for me, I think we have a tendency to become very technical once we are inside. But in the end, if you think about the Baltic Sea strategy and think about that jar of water, and all the challenges that we have in the strategy, all those strategies, all, the, all those challenges, we can only solve <coughs> if we cooperate with a larger number of people than those we usually have. And I think for me, the main part is then also to make sure that, yeah, as you said, kind of solutions need to be worked on locally, that we get people involved in saying, well, everybody around the Baltic Sea region is actually part of those corporations to build the solutions, and by that gets a project idea and what is happening in terms of concrete actions much more on the forefront instead of discussing very yeah, strange governance approaches which are interesting for those involved, but um, for young people seeing the state of the environment or seeing the sea, um, I think our discussions about multi-annual financial frameworks and governance systems might be rather scary. So I think by focusing really on the challenges that we need to solve together and making sure that this is not solving it between different administrations, but actually involving people in those projects. And all the projects of the flagships involve real people and also quite a lot of young people. So I think maybe we should put that more on the forefront. Mr. Bergquist. Yeah. Well, that, that was not an easy question, and I guess there is some kind of Nobel Prize in, in the end if you know, have the correct answer. But I think the first thing is we shouldn't panic. Uh, we sh shouldn't panic. Uh, and, and actually realize that what we are doing is what we have to do. We have to try to, and we're doing a good job, develop all Europe, rise uh, employment, uh, uh, make uh, Europe a better place to live. Uh, and together with that, and that's of course a necessity to do the other thing, is we need to, to meet, to cooperate even more. We have to cooperate within the possibility for, for strategies, within the possibility for programs, but also in other kind of, of, of organization. For example, we are a member of a, a regional organization in all Europe, the CPMR, where we meet uh, other regional uh, people and we, we have also project ideas, but also how can we develop uh, together, how can we have an idea of exchange. So it's not a quick fix, but if we believe in, in what we do, and we try to do that in a way even more intense, uh, and f don't forget, if we talk to each other, things will most of the time go in the right direction. If we stop talking, they will certainly go in, in the wrong direction. Mr. Szymanski. No, it's a huge political question. I think this is the question uh, present in every political debate in, in Europe today. In Poland, we haven't any specific direct experience with the skepticism or even worse, hostility to Europe. We, we have a comfort of uh, a quite wide social support for European integration. Our parliament is practically uh, unified on EU affairs. So, so it's quite distance experience. But what I understand from someone else's uh, experience, both in, this, in the north and in the south, I think we, here we have a quite different nature of insurgency against Europe. What I understand, uh, we should uh, be a little bit more careful about the adaptation of this project. Probably it's a universal truth in politics. If you see a, a phenomenon, a social phenomenon, not incidental, growing in fact, you have to ask yourself how far you can confront it and how far you can adapt to it. And the European integration project will be alive, will be revived, if it will be ad open to adaptation. It's of course very easy to say, not very easy to implement, because what does it mean adaptation? It's a tricky thing, you can make a mistake, but um, quite closed, passive or sometimes uh, hostile uh, approach to new social phenomenon is a wrong answer for sure. In Poland we sometimes uh, used to say that the better is the worst enemy of the good. I think it's a it's quite pragmatic approach to unwelcomed situation 
which is uh, quite relevant to the situation in many member states, including the funding member states, where we see a kind of anti-European insurgency, if not just a scepticism toward the state of play with Europe. Uh, I think we should open this, this project and think twice what, it, what does it mean today. Mr. Stubb, you have the concluding words in 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's a bit scary. Probably if I had the answer to that, I'd still be prime minister to, <laughs> to a certain extent. Uh, but I think, you know, I'll give you a couple of observations. Number one is I think the European Union is very good at creating growth and jobs, but not very good at distributing uh, those that growth and, and those jobs. So income disparity is one. Number two, I think 2016 was a watershed in world politics for two reasons. One was Brexit and the other was Donald Trump. And the Anglo-Saxon slash liberal democratic, liberal international world that a lot of EU nerds like myself have strongly believed and can continue to believe changed. And it changed for a long time. Uh, and I think the consequence of that will be what you referred to and alluded to in your question, very messy election results. You know, you've seen that in the Netherlands, Belgium, you've seen it in Finland, you've seen it in Germany, Italy, uh, Slovenia. And do you know what? I think we have something like 13 to 15 European elections by the end of 2019. So that means in half of the EU member states. And you're going to continue to see that. Now, what is the final solution? Nice analysis. Um, I, I think it's very result-based, and I think that's what everyone around the panel have been saying, that you know, we need to provide good results. But there's one more thing as well, and I'll push this a bit. I, you know, I think we sometimes try to be a little bit too rational with Europe, with the European Union. We try to make rational arguments about net contributors and net receivers and, and, and policies and these guys. You know what? Quite often it's a little bit more about heart than head. And I think we saw that with both Brexit and Trump. And Europe, to a certain extent, has woken up uh, after these colossal events and gone, whoops, you know, we kind of need each other more than we need to separate from each other. And my final point, and I know I got a little bit in a bad spot when I said this in Norway, being against the European Union is a little bit like being against the Internet. Not very smart. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent conclusion. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this very interesting debate. I think we covered both the technical, political and, well, the philosophical aspects uh, of, uh, of the issue. Uh, I think you all deserve um, a great applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.